Hello and welcome to another Talk to Stu with me, Stuart Magoo. Uh, so here I am again with another Universal Credit Employment Support Allowance and PIP update. So uh, obviously there are other benefits as well and you may be claiming those, uh, but these, this one specifically focuses on those three. Uh, so what's going on in the world of the Department of Work and Pensions? Uh, well, quite a lot recently. Uh, there's been a whole raft of changes to the way benefits are going to be administered and operate in the future, uh, announced in the budget, which happened uh, very recently, uh, depending on when you're watching this video. Uh, so, yeah, quite a lot of changes that will affect the way these things are uh, sort of uh, administered, as I say, will affect uh, payments as well, and uh, what, what sort of money you might expect to receive, and will indeed uh, affect how things work for you while you're claiming these benefits. So, uh, what are those changes? Let's get right into it. So, the big thing that was announced, uh, which probably did make it through to some mainstream media uh, outlets, uh, is the uprating of benefit payments in line with inflation. Now, just to be clear, this isn't always in line with inflation. Okay, This is in line with inflation as it was in September 2022. So at that point, inflation was at 10.1%. So in April of next year, uh, or leading up to April of next year, you will start to see increases in those benefit payments uh, up to 10.1%. So that could work out for uh, a lot of people as being around about £600 a year. If you're a family on universal credit and you've got multiple uh, elements to that, including uh, supporting children, uh, all of that sort of thing. In real terms, for the majority of people claiming universal credit, it won't be an increase of anywhere near that much. Uh, but if you are receiving universal credit, you will see uh, those increases uh, going through. If you're on employment support allowance and a number of other benefits you can expect to see the same increases as well. Uh, so they are income based job seekers allowance, income related employment support allowance, income support, pension credit, tax credits, housing benefit, council tax support, social fund, which includes the Sure Start Maternity Grant, Funeral Payment, Cold Weather and the Cold Weather Payment, and Universal Credit, of course, as we mentioned. So, uh, this is part of a £26 billion government package uh, to uh, sort of support uh, the, the benefit system and people that are struggling. Um, is it going to work out well, obviously, you know, that increase is going to be welcome. Any increase is welcome. Uh, it won't track with inflation. So if inflation goes up any higher between now and April, that will not really uh, be be factored into it. It literally will just be that 10.1% increase that was there in September. Already in October, we've seen it go up to 11.1%. Um, so, uh, you know, we could see it go up even further. Uh, it's quite likely. Um, you know, uh, is it a good thing? Is it not? We're not sure. I mean, any increase is better than none. So that's good. Uh, also in this £26 billion package is a, uh, a new thing that's going to be applied to people claiming universal credit with the employment support allowance element of universal credit. So if you're on the old style employment support allowance, so not claiming universal credit, then this won't affect you. It's only for people that are 
under universal credit as far as I know at this stage. It doesn't mean it won't change and also apply to employment support allowance, old style, but at the moment it's just people who are on employment support allowance. Now, this is a bit of a strange one because uh, universal credit claimants across the country will be asked to work with a work coach. The idea of this is if you are um, in a position where you're not able to work because of illness or disability, then they will be looking at uh, coaching you to uh, potentially go back into some form of employment. Equally, they'll be doing that with people who are also just claiming normal style universal credit where they are you know, looking for work and, and so on. And the idea is to get people that are economically inactive to increase their economic activity or to increase their earnings. Um, so how that quite works out if you're working full time and on minimum wage, uh, I'm not really sure. You know, it might be that you can go into better paid employment, but um, yeah in real terms that may not actually be a possibility for you and if you're not well enough to work or you're on long-term sick or um, you know you may be permanently unable to work then maybe this will not come as a, a welcome scheme it's already been trialed in different areas of the country and according to the dwp they think it was successful uh, according to a lot of different uh, groups that have been sort of keeping an eye on this, it's actually uh, increased people's stress levels and uh, led more people to, towards feeling suicidal and under a lot of pressure uh, to, to achieve things that they're otherwise unable to achieve. Um, so it's, it's a bit questionable as to whether that's actually going to work out positively or not. Obviously, if you are trying to get back into work and you want to increase your earnings and you want to engage with that positively, then that could be uh, something that's of benefit to you. But if, of course, you are prevented from whatever reason, availability of jobs, availability of earnings, availability uh, sorry, availability of increasing earnings, availability of being healthy and able to work, uh, then obviously that's going to be more of a challenge. Um, interestingly, uh, there was a uh, report in the disabilitynewsservice.com uh, on the 3rd of November where the new DWP boss, Mel Stride, uh, who replaced Chloe Smith, on 25th of October, claimed in uh, Parliament and was recorded in Hansard and then reported on in the news that there were 2.5 million people who were on long-term sick and economically inactive but wanted to work. Well, actually, that's a false figure, uh, a complete mis misrepresentation of the statistics from the ONS. The reality is, is that actually of that 2.59 million people, only 581,000, so 23%, so less than a fifth, uh, sorry, slightly more than a fifth, slightly more than a fifth, not less than a fifth, less than a quarter. 23% uh, of people want to, to get back into work. Now, uh, the the rest of them and it's not really about want uh, you know it's also about can, can they or can't they so that really is quite misleading and gives the impression that actually uh, people are being failed when in fact um, you know probably the the problem in terms of people wanting to get back into work and not being able to because they're prevented to is is probably not quite uh, what they're making out it is and that in real terms what needs to happen is actually there needs to be more support for the remainder of people who who can't get back into work and who don't 
want to get back into work because it would be detrimental to their health or well-being to to get back into work that they actually need more support um you know to be able to live you know decent quality lives and not be stressed out all the time i mean certainly for people with severe mental health problems and uh things like that you know these kind of comments sort of suggest that uh things are are going to get more stressful as we move along uh for for people on employment support allowance hopefully we won't see that there is some good news for people on old style employment support allowance as we know there is currently a migration occurring where people on old style employment support allowance are being asked to move on to claiming universal credit now it could be a good thing for those people to move on to universal credit they may be better off by doing so uh, it may be that actually they're not better off by doing so it entirely depends how that happens there is something in place called transitional protection which is supposed to protect the amount of money that you uh, get from employment support allowance and make sure that you receive the same if you move over onto universal credit but that hasn't worked out as being the case for a lot of people and that transitional protection is only in there for a certain length of time after which it disappears and then you go on to the normal universal credit rates so uh, a lot of people are very stressed out about doing that and again it's very confusing to move over onto universal credit uh, because it means having to uh, have some changes going on not just with your income benefit but also with your housing benefit and uh, your uh, council tax support and things like that just to be clear your income benefit is employment support allowance so uh, what's happening is they're putting the brakes on with this migration a little bit i think they've realized they've bitten off a little bit more than they could chew in terms of their targets which was to get everybody moved over onto universal credit by the end of 2024 uh, the um those targets i think were pre-pandemic and so that's probably thrown things into a bit of confusion uh, so there's currently around 2.6 million people still on the old style of benefits uh, not just employment support allowance but also working tax credit child tax credit job seekers allowance income support income related employment support allowance and housing benefit uh, so they're all going to have to move over at some point but now the uh, end date or the goal uh, to, to get that done by is now 2028. So if uh, you're already in the process of moving over, then that will continue, obviously. And it doesn't mean that you won't be asked to move over in the next year or two. You may still be asked to migrate onto Universal Credit at that time. Uh, they they are still trying to get people to to move through as uh, uh, not so much as quickly as possible but as, but as smoothly as possible and indeed uh, that will still be happening but for some people it might mean that actually they're not going to be pressured into doing that just at the moment so hopefully that's you uh, if you are on the old style employment support allowance and you were worrying about doing that now there is uh, an investment also been announced into cracking down on fraudsters uh, as the sun describes them uh, so yeah uh, the dwp wastes a lot of money it says in its report that was released in the summer uh, on fraud and error now, what we know from the past, uh, on previous reports that were done, was that generally speaking, the DWP lost more to errors than it did to fraud. The DWP is now claiming that since the pandemic, more people have been claiming benefits fraudulently than were before. They've invested uh, 280 million, they say, into setting up a new fraud and error department, which is to seek out uh, errors and to seek out fraud. 
and put a stop to that. Uh, the figures that are being touted as part of this uh, paper that was produced in the summer and uh, is referred to in the uh, information that's come out in, in the background of the autumn statement is questionable from uh, a lot of people's point of view and indeed it is being questioned in Parliament. Well, where did you get these numbers? How have you worked it out? Oh, we're not showing you our, our working out. No, no, you don't need to see that. Just trust us. We're saying it's very hard. Um, do we trust them? I don't know. That's up to you. You decide whether you trust the DWP or not. Uh, but indeed they are pushing ahead with that. Uh, part of it, which is a concern for people, is that this new fraud group will uh, be able to do things such as trawling people's social media to prove that they're not as disabled uh, as they actually are. Um, indeed, uh, in my working life, I've uh, come across more occasions where uh, someone was falsely accused of fraud where it was in fact uh, an error on the part of the DWP in their assessment system uh, and of course they for one reason or another uh, not been able to to make any changes and uh, appeal that and indeed they've ended up having to pay back a lot of money and in some cases be convicted of fraud when actually they were quite disabled and uh, it was just the way the system was that they got tied up with that. Equally, I've also seen people that were accused falsely uh, be able to appeal and um, uh, continue claiming the benefits that they were uh, eligible for. So, you know, it can go either way. And occasionally there are people that I've come across who are uh, fraudulent with claiming benefits but generally speaking that tends to be more around the working benefits such as uh, you know the old days of job seekers allowance where people would be claiming that and maybe doing a little bit of cash in hand work which is infinitely more common than well not infinitely that's giving that the wrong impression it's much more common than actually disabled people uh, claiming benefits fraudulently because actually it's really hard to claim disability benefits in the first place uh, unless you are very unwell and most not most but a significantly large number of people are having to go through mandatory reconsideration and appeals just to get the uh, money that they are entitled to uh, and should get and need to support them also happening is the benefit uh, cap is being raised as well uh, by 10.1% in line with the uh, inflation rate. So again, that's happening in April of 2023. Um, so for uh, most families, uh, that's being raised from uh, 20,000 to 22,000 and some change and uh, 23 to 25 in the greater London area. So, you know, uh, generally speaking, not a great increase considering the things that we're all having to spend money on at the moment. And anybody who has a family of uh, husband, wife and two children will know that uh, most families cost around about £40,000 a year to support. So £22,000 falls quite far below that. And that £22,000, actually, you're only getting that if you have uh, children who are also disabled and, you know, other complicating factors as well. Uh, a lot of families uh, probably get much lower than that amount anyway. Uh, extra cost of living payments. So this one's a bit vague. Uh, so uh, there's been uh, apparently uh, over 8 million struggling households out there at the moment. Uh, again, not quite sure where they get these numbers from. Uh, they uh, apparently will be paid a one-off £900 support payment. So a lot of vagaries with this. First of all, they haven't said when that's going to happen. Uh, they haven't said how that's going to happen, so, you know, uh, they also haven't said what the exact eligibility 
of it is. So there's a lot of guesswork around this. We're assuming that it's going to be very similar to the £6,650 one-off payment uh, that's come out this year. Um, as you know, the first payment was in July. The second payment was supposed to be in October, but in fact hasn't really happened for the majority of people uh, and is currently going through. So hopefully you should be seeing the second part of that payment hitting your bank account in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, so it may come uh, in one lump sum, it may come in a couple of parts like that, it may come in more parts. Uh, it might be paid through a bill, uh, like the £400 energy uh, bill support that uh, is, being in pay, is being paid in £66 instalments. So it could be any of these things, we really don't know. Uh, they haven't given a lot of information at this time. So, yeah, that's about the size of it. Now, obviously, for people claiming personal independence payment, there have been uh, a number of changes lately uh, that are sort of filtering through. We're seeing a bigger rollout now of the online applications for people. We're also seeing a bigger rollout of uh, video uh, assessments as well. So those are things that people are finding. Again, it's very much a postcode lottery as to what kind of uh, application you're offered to make. It might be when you phone up to, to make an application in the first place, you're told you can do it online. Um, it might be that uh, when you're invited for an assessment, you are asked to uh, go for a face-to-face -face assessment they're starting up again we're seeing more of those happening around the country uh, but it's not exclusive for everybody some people are being offered video assessment instead as an alternative uh, many people are still having telephone assessments so uh, do be aware if you are having a video assessment uh, they will uh, as they would in a face-to-face -face assessment they may ask you to engage in some physical demonstrations of your ability so for example if you've indicated on your form that maybe you have some damage to your left arm maybe the result of a stroke or something like that um, you know maybe it's parkinson's maybe you know it could be uh, an injury or something where you've lost the use of your arm and you're saying well i can't lift heavy pans you know, or something like that. They may ask you to raise your arms up at the same time or do something with your arms or whatever. Um, so, you know, they may be asking these physical things. Could be other parts of the body. Uh, do bear in mind, uh, you can always say no to doing those things, particularly if it would cause you any pain or distress in doing uh, these things. You can always say no. Do explain your reason why you're saying no uh, to do that. Uh, if you can attempt to do them and you wish to, then that's absolutely fine. If you think it will show them uh, your your abilities or your, the limits of your abilities, then yeah, uh, do that. But make sure whatever you do, you're safe when you do that. If they, uh, I remember when in one of my assessments, I was asked to raise up on my ankles and I had to hold on to something at the time because I was very unsteady because my ankles are very weak. Um, you know, and I did almost fall while that was happening, and the assessor just said, no, that's fine, just, um, you know, settle yourself back down, uh, that's okay, I've seen what I need to, you know, so do take care when you're doing those things. Um, it is, like I say, quite, uh, quite worrying that those things might be there, but, you know, like I say, you're, you're in charge of you, and if a decision is made that you don't agree with or you think is wrong, it can always be challenged. Okay, uh, an assessment like this does not does not supersede medical assessments that you've had. Okay, this is an assessment about your uh, eligibility for PIP. It's not a medical assessment to say whether or not you're you you do have a health condition. Okay. So, uh, and their decisions could be wrong, they often are. So that can always be challenged at mandatory reconsideration or appeal. And remember to always get professional support if you can with doing those kind of things. So, 
that's the news. Uh, some of this I've got from uh, uh, you know uh, news sources online, including the Sun, which I'm really not happy about. Um, but uh, it was the the only one that came up with the detail that I needed. Um, also, uh, the Disability News Service they uh, are always very good, and uh, Bristol Live uh, they had some good bits of news there, and obviously my role you can find this news out for yourself but i'm just kind of putting the um dis uh, disability uh, rights uh, advocate view on things or the information and advice view on things you might say uh, obviously a lot of what i've said is my opinion and shouldn't be taken as uh, a fact and uh, one thing we should always do is uh, say what the DWP said. So going back to my earlier comments about DWP boss Mal Stride making the comments that he did, uh, the DWP responded to that uh, by saying, as the Secretary of State said in the House of Commons, he is committed alongside the Department of Health and Social Care to assisting and supporting those who are long-term sick and would like to work back into the workplace. Um, which grammatically makes no sense, uh, if nothing else, uh, didn't seem to be addressing why he'd used mis uh, statistics that were wrong um, at all either. But there we go, you know, for balance, we we'll have to say these things. Um, mm, so there we go. Uh, Anyway, that's my news report for now. Uh, like, share and subscribe if you found this useful. Uh, hopefully I'm going to be putting out some more um, uh, information videos very soon. So do stick with the channel. Uh, obviously I try and get as much out there as I can. But sometimes it's a challenge. And yeah, uh, do comment below. Uh, have a chat with each other. Do ask questions if you have questions. doesn't mean I'll definitely be able to answer them. I try and answer as many as I can. Uh, but uh, also chat to each other. Keep it congenial and friendly. Uh, no uh, insulting uh, each other and uh, whatnot on there. Generally speaking, everybody's very supportive on my channel. Do be aware that if you make a rude comment, I'll just delete it. This isn't a uh, sort of free speech democracy area. I'm not going to have any of that. So off it goes. Just click delete. And you might even get yourself blocked. So remember that. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, hope you found it useful. And stay well, stay happy as much as you can. And keep fighting the good fight. And uh, yeah, see you again soon. Take care. Thanks very much for listening. And have a good night or day.